Hello, this is Gary Meyer of Glendale Community College. This screencast is from my CS150AB class, Summer 17 Online. Before I get started with Chapter 7, let's talk quickly about Chapter 6 and how it might relate to this one. Um, in Chapter 6, which was on arrays, I talked to you about a couple scenarios where arrays were a great solution if you were looking for speed improvements. And in there, I talked about the fact that Arrays are stored in computer memory, in volatile memory, so when the power goes out, so does the array, versus non-volatile environments where the information was stored on disk or flash drive or optical CD, which is a situation where it's using persistent non-volatile storage. So for this chapter, we're going to talk a little bit about non-volatile storage, and I'm going to say just a little bit. Some of the concepts, especially the database concepts, really I cannot do them justice in one chapter in a very short period of time like we have in this class. So we're going to give some surface coverage to this chapter. It's not going to have the same importance or depth that some of the earlier ones have. And as a result, this is probably going to be a fairly quick video. But I will follow it up with another video that will correspond to what you have to know for the assignment on data storage, which is primarily reading from a text file, which is a fairly straightforward process. So let's get started. Persistent storage is files or devices like hard drives and um, flash memory and optical disks that store files. And the files that we're going to be most concerned with are sequential data files or files that hold data that's going to either be stored in the act of processing information or retrieved in the act of you know retrieving and processing that information. There are a whole bunch of files available on PCs, you know, binary files, executable files that are actually programs that are compiled, graphical files, graphics files, PNG, GIFs, JPEGs. Although those are files, they're all on persistent storage, but we're not going to talk about those at all. We're only interested in those situations where the file can hold data. So we're going to talk about sequential data files um, specifically, and to a lesser extent, database and XML files. Now, database files are probably best served in a database management class, of which we offer MSSQL both semesters, spring and fall, online. And that class will go into much more detail on how databases work and the advantages of using a database, let's say, over a sequential file. XML is a file type that's sequential, but it's used almost exclusively with web processing. Uh, although maybe not as much as it used to, it's got some other you know niceties about it. It's basically putting information into a file in a text format, so it could be seen by a text editor like Notepad. But it's typically using tags like HTML. It's a descendant of HTML. It's the same family. That uh, these tags identify. Um, things like the uh, field name and then any special um, constraints or um, rules that apply to that particular field much like a database does so it has the power of doing some of the the uh, constraint restrictions that a database has but it has the simplicity of uh, sequential files and it also passes easily in, in and out of browsers from database servers so it's very very popular for web applications the class, we do have a class in XML here. It's taught every couple of years. I would say that uh, of these three technologies, one will cover in class. Database, we have a special class for. We also have a special class for XML, which I would be most interested in if your career track is going to take you to the world of the web. Definitions, small type, I'm sorry. <laughs> All this is in the book. Um, what this is trying to do at this point is just showing the relationship and terminology of a file system. Uh, could be in Linux, Unix, Apple. When you go into that console mode and you start going to directories and subdirectories, that's the file system. It has folders. The folders contain subfolders and files. The files have extensions, which help to identify the file type it is. Files that we're concerned with are data files, which typically are organized in a record format where every line or every row contains a particular piece of related information and that related information is a data field. So for example, if it was an employee file, there would be a record called Gary Marr for name. It would have Gary Marr in one data field for name. It would have my address in another data field, my department, my date of birth, my social security number. 
the smallest unit you would have in a file system would be a character. Files of this type can be opened with Notepad, Notepad++, or any text editor. Um, our Python programs are using in class our sequential files. Graphics of what I just said. Uh, I don't think there's any part of what we've, we're going to talk about these initial slides or in the chapter that you haven't learned in CS105, or I hope you've learned with CS105. If you have questions, Google it, Wikipedia it, give me a call, and I can help straighten it out for you. One of the reasons, one of the things I like to talk about, one of the reasons we cover this topic in this book is that because historically, I guess I'm old enough to remember the bad old days when mostly what the computer did was transaction processing. You had master files, transaction files, exception files. And these files essentially you would use together coordinated uh, the handling of data for your organization. Typically it was financial, banking, insurance, order entry, bill payment, stuff like that. The master file typically was a summary record. It normally had the customer information. And in the case of banking, it might have had a opening balance field. The transaction files were all the business you did with the bank. Deposits, credits, checks, fees, etc. When all rolled up for the month, it gave you a monthly summary, which might go into a master file. The idea here is that the transaction file was kind of at the 10-foot level, master at the 100-foot level. Master was more of a summary, transaction was more detail. Exception files are, were usually created in the processing of transactions, and what they were used for is to identify the problems that could occur in a transaction environment. You know, count number not found. Um, balance uh, in insufficient funds. Exception files were typically created so they could be handled manually by someone who is working with the system. And, excuse me, <laughs> and um, were part of the quality or the accuracy of the data that was going to be stored in the system. All file systems, whether it's a sequential text file, whether it's a database file, whether it's a you know, uh, even a web page, or even a program file, Python, you're typically going to have activity against that file. are going to be adding information, changing information, or deleting information. It could be records, it could be partly data, it could be the whole file. But add, change, delete is typical, typically three functions we're always going to perform against files, and especially data files. The reason I bring that up is that's the kind of thing we're going to talk about some of our examples. Uh, PC files, I think this should be largely review. I would hope that file um, path naming is largely review. I would just tell you that whether you're in Apple or Linux or wherever you are, Android, which is really just Linux anyways, you should see something similar to this. This is something here that we do need to pay a little more attention to because this is something that will probably come up in one of our assignments. And I'll have a separate video that shows you how this works in Python. Because even though pseudocode is a great way to diagram our logic, it's a lot better to see it running in action, which means we'd have to convert it to a program. As a rule, anytime you work with a sequential file, you're going to have one part of your program open the file. One part of the program probably loop through the file record by record in either reading information or changing it. And then the last thing you'll always do is close the file. Now, opening files is usually something everybody remembers to do. Processing the information is also kind of a no-brainer, but a lot of times you forget to close the file. It's not so much a problem today, but back in the bad old days of DOS, if you had too many files open at one time, you basically, your programs came to halt until you freed up a couple files for the, uh, the applications to use. So just in the sense of, from a standardization standpoint, if you're going to open something, you should close it. So please don't forget to close it when you're done. The way this pseudocode is working here, again, it's non-structured. This is not going to run anywhere. This is just, you know, logic. It's going to open one file for input, one file for output. So one we're going to read from, one we're going to write to. And then it's going to loop, loop through the one that we're reading from. And it's going to basically, by column, pull some information off and store it in an identifier or a variable, columns 1 through 10, 11 through 20, etc. It's going to manipulate one of those pieces of information that was read in, and then it's going to write out a new record that shows a change in one of those data fields, and ultimately it's going to close the files. This is pretty typical of what happens with transaction processing. You open the files, 
you process the files, you write out some new information, you append some information, you close the files. Typical transaction process that you're going to find a lot in insurance and finance and banking. This is a similar scenario. Um, I would say it's not dramatically different. It's just another example. I will go through as part of another video some Python examples where I can actually you know, show the records being changed and what it looked like before I started in the file and what it looked like after I was completed. The logic that we create in pseudocode is very functional and practical for putting down a design, but it doesn't beat actually putting it or implementing it to code so that we can actually test it to make sure it runs correctly. So I'll do some of that for you. You will not have a lot of this Chapter 7 in tests or in assignments. The stuff that you do have will be a very small subset of information that's easy for me to identify up front. And I would expect that it's, in the grand scheme of things, not one of our highlighted topics for this, this particular class. Databases. Now, huge topic. Can't cover it in one chapter. Can't cover it in one lecture. Can't cover it in one class. This is enormous. Um, I would say if you're interested in databases, in which you all should have a database class of some type, take at least the access class. Better yet, take MySQL. It's offered every semester. Basically, a database is surrounded by a database management system, which controls access and authentication. It helps you with accuracy, the redundancy of data. It's a much more efficient, effective way of storing data. It's a, a much more practical way of storing large amounts of data where a lot of people have to access the data. Um, typically, the way we work with it from a programming environment is that our user will go through an application program. It could be something on the internet. It could be something running on a local network. But it's an application program that we've designed with logic that will make calls to the database to extract data update data, delete data, and then return from the database the, either the completion of that task or the data manipulated somehow. Uh, the way we work with um, Canvas, uh, SIS, any web-based database that you're accessed for GCC is essentially using this model. You're going through a web page that's calling some web services in the uh, server that connects to a database, extracts the information that you have access to, and then displays it for you. Uh, file systems um, that aren't web-based, uh, you're not going to see this too much because you're internet students, but if you came to GCC, if you went to the S drive, you would find that it's a shared drive, and then there's a folder called Courses, and then there there's, well, it could be all the courses offered at GCC, but in my case, I could only see the courses that I offer. That's because from a security standpoint, it's only authenticated me to look at certain things. We can share some information. In other words, my S drive a uh, folder called GMAR under uh, CS150AB. You can look at, you have read access, but I have read and write access. All of that is controlled um, by the database. Okay, that's a good example. Um, now, from a vocabulary standpoint, it's not so much, this may be new, but I guess this is not so much learning new terms as understanding how they equate to sequential files. A table is like a file, a row is like a record, a column is like a data field. So if you go back to that example before, employees would be the table, the row would be employee records, and the columns would be my name, my date of birth, my social security number, my department. Now in addition, uh, databases also have uh, some other attributes that can be defined. One is a primary key, another is a foreign key, and there's also some other things still that we can set up in a database that will either expedite us seeing the data, accessing the data, um, ensuring that the data is accurate, helping ensure it's, the data is accurate. Let me give you an example. I could have a lawnmower business and I could put all my customers from a billing standpoint on a spreadsheet or on a database. Um, the first field of the spreadsheet would be uh, customer ID. And I would create customer ID to be the primary field in my table called customers in a database. Now, as I add customers, I would have to have a unique number. Otherwise, my billing would get followed up because I wouldn't be able to, you know, make sure that that customer paid for their lot of work for that month. And also, if they paid me, I'd want to show a zero balance. I could all get that to work in Excel just fine if I was careful. 
to make sure that I didn't duplicate a customer ID. If I duplicate a customer ID by mistake, let's say I'm five screens down, I didn't realize I used the customer ID and I created another one just like one that I already created. I now have a referential integrity situation on my flat file Excel system where I don't have a unique identifier. I can set up my tables in the database environment so that my customer account has a primary key. Primary key means it cannot be duplicated, only one can exist. When I add that new customer in there, it would kick me out of the ad saying that I could not add that record because that record already existed. That will help the accuracy of my data. It also allows me to create many tables which can be joined as opposed to a flat file environment where a lot of data gets duplicated. Okay, this is a little bit more tricky to explain, but let me let me take a crack at it here. <clears throat> Let's say that I'm in a database, uh, that I have a, a fitness center, and that I've kept my membership records in Excel, but I also have a business in the back that does personal training, and their uh, which is their membership, which is the same as mine, keeps track of their appointments for personal training on a different Excel spreadsheet. The customer came in, they booked a time for um, their personal training, but then let's say a week later, or, and then at the same time they changed their telephone number. Said, so, listen, I want a, you know, an activity with you guys next Monday, but my telephone number's changed, here it is. Well, that's all been changed in the, in the spreadsheet that exists in the personal training area, but the membership database, which is the front desk, doesn't know about this. So now all of a sudden there's an issue where um, somebody in the personal training department had to cancel that appointment. And they said, well, you know, could someone at the front desk help call that customer? Well, yeah, they would help call them, but they would have the old phone number. There's nothing in the system that ensures that any changes are coordinated. What we can do with database environments is we can create a lot of small tables that are joined by foreign keys that link them together. And so that we can then improve the redundancy. We don't have to have duplicate columns for phone number like existed in the other example with Excel spreadsheets, but we can arrange the data in a way such that we only have one place to hold phone number. And if the application is slightly different in the case of the personal training, we can create additional tables just for personal training that are joined by other keys. And all a key does is it matches the records together. It says this record here matches to this primary key. This person you know, Joe Schmo is Joe Schmo in the membership table. And again, that's a little tough to explain without a big old whiteboard in front of me, but I will tell you that these are the aspects of a database that make them a much better solution, for, especially for larger, uh, at larger databases, larger data requirements where there's a lot of people using the data, especially. Um, and again, the best way to learn that information is to take a database class. <clears throat> Now, this slide probably is mislabeled uh, a little bit. It says SQL at the top, which stands for Structured Query Language. In all databases that are relational, which are most of them, there's actually different kinds of databases, but most databases are relational, have a Structured Query Language, which is a language that allows you to extract, insert, update, delete. Remember that from a couple slides ago? Information in your database tables. Now. I can't really do this justice here. I'm not sure I can do it justice in the book, but there's a lot more examples in the book on this topic than I'm going to talk about in the slides. Um, look this over. This is simply add, change, delete, database style. It works the same, at least uh, from a high level, as add, change, delete to a text file. At least the operations are the same. The fact that we have SQL available makes it a little bit easier and more standard across multiple databases, which is what I've listed down here. This happens to be just some databases we you know, typically talk about when we, when we get into the world of database. MySQL, MS Access, SQL Express, SQL Server are all databases that will be sometimes introduced as part of a programming class or in the case of, of MySQL and MS Access are actually classes we teach at GCC. DreamSpark is mentioned down here, and this name is, I think, undergoing a change now, but this is the academic alliance that we joined from Microsoft that allows our students to download free products, and I believe that you can download free copies of SQL Express to use as part of programming, but not for this class as much as maybe future classes or if you're interested in, in uh, SQL later on. MySQL, the class that we spent you know, a fair amount of time teaching here on campus, is open source. It's basically a freebie. 
It was developed as a freebie and eventually was bought by Oracle, so they now own it. Oracle probably is the largest major player in databases, and they also have a personal version uh, that you can use uh, that's free. But uh, I would say that if you plan on spending time in technology, and that's the reason this Leatherman's tool is up here, you want to make sure that your experience has as many different blades or topics as you can fit. So in other words, you probably want to take a class in database. You probably want to take a class in some sort of web development. You probably want to take a programming class. And each one of those classes would be a blade because your first job, you're really not sure what you're going to end up doing, but you want to have a cross-section of experience. A lot of times they'll say you want to be a mile wide and an inch deep. That's it for this chapter, but uh, again, the caveat is this is not a major chapter because it's got a lot of topics in here. Don't let this drown you in information because it's a Topic we need, there's topics here we need to address, but it's not a major focus of this class. If you got any questions, let me know, email, phone, or we can do a video chat session. Thank you.